If you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to Mark chapter 4 with me today. Uh, 2020, <clears throat> so far, the, the greatest year of all time. Um, starting from January on, all the way up till now, uh, it's been, pre- let's just be honest, it's been a pretty rotten year. It's not, not been the best year. And by the way, you can stop and say, I've been blessed all the way through. I've been blessed all year long, even though there's been some tough times, even though there's been some um, decis- decisions that's had to have to be made and um, difficult things. We've had losses. We've had, we've gone through a lot this year, but we're still blessed. We're still, we're still blessed. But 2020 has not been <coughs> our favorite year. Let's just put it that way. It's not been our favorite year. Um, if it's taught people anything at all, it is to be afraid. That is what 2020 has done. Um, you've seen the memes, all those little memes that pop up. If 2020 were a whatever, and it's just a disastrous picture. Um, there, this is what everybody sees 2020 as. But it's taught us to be afraid. The coronavirus started the whole snowball effect back at the beginning of the year. Um, we all remember the beginning of the year. We remember uh, February, March. Remember what was going on then? An unknown virus crept into our country and we didn't have the answers. It was all unknown. We didn't know what it was going to be like. And the fear of the unknown paralyzed the majority of our nation. <clears throat> it, it stopped us. Not only our nation either. It's a worldwide pandemic, so it, it got everybody. The next big event was the shutdown. You know, the, and some states are still going through that. We have been blessed. But um, the shutdown was the next big thing. A lot of business owners lost their businesses. Um, There's a lot of people who had financial security, but that financial security was shaken, and they don't know how they're going to make ends meet even to today. And on top of that, the whole year, we've had political conflicts all the way through. So it's not like we're just going from one thing to the other. They're kind of melding together. We've had political uh, uh, conflicts all year long. Both parties have been against each other all year long. No matter which side you stand on, both parties have been against each other all year long. And the stability of our nation has been brought into question so much that we are divided in a big way right now as a nation. (coughs) On top of it all, um, people are now in fear of what's going to happen to our city streets if one candidate or the other one wins. Biden supporters fear Trump and Trump supporters fear Biden. And it's just, this whole year is insane. It's, it's just a crazy year. If 2020 has taught us to do anything, it is to fear for most people. The good news is that 2020 was never supposed to be what we were learning from. We were never supposed to, that wasn't supposed to be our teacher. That wasn't supposed to be our leader. So whatever this year has conditioned us to think like, I want to take a few minutes and just tell everybody, let's just turn that off. Let's just turn that off for a few minutes here. God has the real answer and his lessons are worth listening to. I promise you he's been around longer than either candidate. He's been around longer than any pandemic. He's been around longer than any bad situation that might come our way. God knows how to handle things. He's, he's still in control. He's still on the throne. In Mark chapter 4, God gives us an awesome story of how he taught the disciples about this concept of being afraid. And he did it in a huge way. I'm, I am actually sometimes really grateful for the fact that I wasn't one of the people in the Bible. And then there's other times when I think, man, it would have been really, really awesome to be that guy. To walk through the Red Sea would have been pretty cool. I think that would have been a really cool thing to see. Um, calling fire down from heaven, that, yeah, that's a good thing. I, I think I would really like to see that. Seeing Jesus, uh, being there when Jesus rose from the dead to see what happened to Jerusalem at the time, that would be awesome to see. But then there's stories like this where I'm thinking, uh, just, I'm glad it was them, not me. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy about that. Jesus had just finished speaking several parables about faith in the kingdom of God. This next story happens immediately after this. So look at Mark chapter 4 and verse 35. It says, On the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. 
this verse tells us how much planning actually went into this trip. Jesus says, let's cross over to the other side. Speaking about the Sea of Galilee, they want to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Then it says that the disciples took Jesus along in the boat as he was. It says, as he was. The boat was the platform where Jesus was speaking to the multitudes. He was, he was preaching from the boat. So he's in the boat when he's preaching to these people. And it says that they took him as he was. So Jesus says, let's cross over to the other side. And basically they start rowing because he's already in the boat. Everything's all ready together. He said, let's go to the other side. And they start moving. They don't have to get anybody on the boat. Jesus is already there. It's important to know that Jesus just spent his day teaching lessons about God and our relationship with God. He just spent the whole day teaching these people. Then he takes off in the boat with the disciples. But you've got to understand what he was doing up to this story. But Jesus wasn't finished teaching even though he appeared to have stopped. He might be done teaching the multitudes, but there's still a group of guys in a boat that he's going with, and he's not done teaching yet. Look at verse 37. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, <clears throat> so that it was already filling. This is the next event, event on Jesus' ministerial calendar. His schedule included a storm, a pretty good-sized storm. This was part of the schedule. It says that the boat was filling up with water. Try to put yourself in the disciples' shoes for a second here. Just put yourself into this position. It says that the boat was filling up with water. It's filling up with water. These guys are cold, they're soaked, and they're afraid that they, they might die. You're in a, and by the way, it's not a cruise ship that they're on. They're, it's a fishing boat. So now they're in the middle of this sea. The waves are, are good-sized waves. The boat's filling up with water. They're afraid they're going to die. While they're all in panic mode, Je Jesus seems to be missing. He's nowhere to be seen. All the disciples are trying to keep themselves alive. They're trying to keep the boat from filling up with water and being destroyed out in the middle of the sea. And Jesus is nowhere to be seen. So they begin to look for him and they did find him. Look at Mark 4:38. <clears throat> but he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Now, there's two pretty big details mentioned here in this verse. First of all, it says Jesus isn't just sleeping. He's sleeping on a pillow. And you think, well, how is that a big detail? It's, it's pretty good sized detail. Because when a person dozes off, you can doze off anywhere. Done it. I've, I've dozed off. If you're tired, it doesn't really matter where you're sitting. You will doze off. And you will sleep on whatever's around. You'll, it could be a total stranger. But you, when you doze off, you're not, really care, you're not really caring about what's around you. You just kind of fall asleep. But when you see a person with a pillow, you see them with a pillow, then you can pretty much bet that they went to sleep intentionally. Oh, well, they brought a pillow. They had plans to go to sleep. This says that Jesus is sleeping on a pillow. He didn't just doze off. No, he, he got comfortable. And he decided to use the pillow. Jesus knew the storm was coming. He knew the rest of his lesson. He knew the storm was coming. He knew the ship was going to fill up with water. He knew that it was going to be a scary situation. He, was, he knows about this. He also knew that it had been a long day and he needed to get some rest. So he gets a pillow and he intentionally goes to sleep. Like, I'm tired. I'm, I'm going to get some sleep. Meanwhile, the disciples are doing everything that they can to stay alive because the storm is overwhelming. The ship's filling up with water and Jesus is just snoozing. So, and, he, and he's doing it on purpose. He's got a pillow. <clears throat> the storm is so overwhelming that it causes them to ask the unsink, un, unsinkable. I, oops, unthinkable. And it didn't sink, by the way. Now, the unthinkable. They ask a question that you would think, why would the 12 disciples of all people, why would they ask this question? Look back at the question that they asked in verse 38 again. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Do you not care that we're perishing? Doubting Jesus' character is what their fear had involved, evolved into. Now we're questioning your character. It's so scary out here. 
We think we're going to die. Our fear has now evolved into questioning the character of God. And it, and it happens. It, it can happen. By the way, the circumstances were both real and life-threatening. It's not just some fake thing that's going on. It's a really serious thing that the disciples are going through here. When the disciples realized that they were in the middle of this storm, they were understandably afraid. I, I get that. They are afraid. But their fear took over to the point where they are now questioning God. We can do the same thing. We have a lot of potential. We, we can do the same thing. We question God. We allow our fear, our anxiety, our worry. We allow it to grow to the point where we start wondering if God really has this under control. And that's where the disciples, that's the point that they got to. This is where Jesus takes the whole event to a deeper level of understanding. Look at verse 39. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? <clears throat> Jesus gets up and he tells the storm to sit down, which they just wake Jesus up. Hey, uh, we're dying. We're going to die. Don't you care that we're going to die? Jesus walks up and says, hey, every, everything stop. And it stops. The storm just stops. Then he looks at the disciples and says, now tell me, why were you so afraid? Why were you, why were you so afraid? He stops the storm. So now he's got the disciples undivided attention. And it would be that way for any one of us. We're going to die. Flip the switch. All right, we're not going to die. It's just over. Just like that. You've got my attention if you have the ability to shut down a storm like that. He has their attention. If Jesus started talking to the disciples <clears throat> while they were focused on the storm, they wouldn't have heard a thing he was saying. They wouldn't have heard him because they were in panic mode. They weren't going to hear Jesus. So Jesus turns off the storm. <laughs> Once the storm stopped, he asked what seems to be an obvious answer. He asked a question and the answer seems very obvious. Why are you so fearful? I know. Big storm. Death. That's why we were so afraid. So why is Jesus asking the question? Well, if you consider the fact that the boat was being tossed around like a rag doll and it was filling up with water, the answer seems clear. But Jesus wasn't referring to the storm. This is where growing deeper in God's word, it can offer you a whole lot. If you, it seems like a stupid question. If Jesus is referring to the storm, I even know that answer. Why, why are you afraid? Lightning, thunder, water, death, impending doom. That's why we're afraid. The answer seems obvious. So, why did he ask the question, why are you so fearful? The storm was the obvious answer, so the question wasn't necessary. So he can't be asking the question about the storm. It can't be that, because even we understood why the disciples were afraid. Jesus <clears throat> couldn't have been asking the questions in reference to the storm, because even he knew the storm was the reason why they were afraid. He, even, he knows that. This question was in reference to what happened on the shore, not to what's happening in the water. You, you, we've got to understand Jesus isn't asking a stupid question. He's asking a legitimate question here. Why are you so afraid? So this question isn't referencing the storm. It's referencing what happened on the shore. Jesus had just given several parables about seeds. Several parables. One of the key points in each of those parables was that a seed... <clears throat> is that if the seed were received, it would grow. That was, that was a point to be taken in every single one of those parables. If you'll take the seed, if the seed's received into the good ground, it's going to grow. If a seed is received, it's going to grow. The disciples had just heard the same message Jesus was teaching to the multitudes. They were there for all of these parables. They were there for the whole lesson. Then Jesus told them what was going to happen next. Let's go back to thir verse 35 and see what he told him was going to happen next. On the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Jesus didn't say, let us pray that we can make it to the other side. He didn't say, let's give it the old college try and see if we can make it to the other side. He didn't say that. He said, let us cross over to the other side. This is what's going to happen next. 
we're going to the other side. We're going to make it to the other side. He informed them of his plans. He's also proven many, many times that he is able and he is trustworthy. They've watched Jesus. They've watched him in his ministry. Yeah, he's able to do these things and he's trustworthy. He says, we're going to the other side. Let's go to the other side. Now, <clears throat> they are in fear of what might happen while they're with Jesus in the boat. The question Jesus asked was a good one. Why are you so fearful? Why are you so fearful? This was in reference to everything he had just taught them and told them was going to happen. Didn't I just talk about this to everybody? I just taught the lesson on the shore. And then I told you, what, what's our next plan? To go to the other side. Right, not die in the middle of the ocean, but go to the other side. That, I told you what was going to come next. I've taught you just like I taught everybody, and I told you my plan. We're going to the other side. So why are you so afraid? Why, knowing what you know, are you so fearful? Why are you so fearful? You've been taught the word of God. <clears throat> You've been informed of what God's going to do next. Still, you fear what might happen. Why? Why? It's a good question. It's a, it's a really good question. The storm was not brought into existence just because two weather systems collided. That, yes, that's, that's how a storm develops, but that is not why this storm showed up. This was a test, and God was the one giving the test. Look at Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 3. The refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the hearts. God knew that, this, that a test was necessary for his disciples to grow. You're going to need, we're going to need to take the whole lesson thing that I did on the shore. We're going to need to take it deeper. We're going to have to go deeper with this. Jesus knew the test wasn't intended for him. God's going to test the disciples and I know that it's not intended for me. So I'm going to grab a pillow and I'm going to go take a nap while they do their panic thing. Jesus isn't worried about what's going to happen. He knows they're going to the other side. He, he knows what God was teaching in the parables that he just taught. He, he knows all of this. So he decides, okay, the lesson that's about to happen isn't intended for me, so I'm just going to chill and, while they panic. Because there's nothing he can do until they get to the point where they realize it, what's happening within themselves. So Jesus grabs a pillow and he takes a nap. This storm was giving the disciples a chance to apply what they had heard. Weren't they there through the lessons? Yes, they were. Didn't Jesus tell them they were going to the other side? Yes, he did. Then it's time for you to apply what you have heard. It's time for you to apply it. A good teacher will only test you on information that you've been taught. You're, you're only going to be tested on information you've been given. So Jesus knows that God's about to test these disciples on information, not that they've been given a long time ago, but just a few minutes ago. We, I just loaded you up with the information. Now, here's the test. Here it is. It's, it's here. It's now. <clears throat> God wants us to take his word from the hearing level to the doing level. And that, that applies to all of us right now. God wants us to go from the hearing level to the doing level. Look at James chapter 1 and verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. He wants it to become less about what we take in and more about what we're putting out. He doesn't just want you to hear the word of God. He wants you to live out the word of God. Application's important. We, we need to apply the word of God. Living the word of God is always better than just reading the word of God. If you think you're fulfilling something and you're doing a great job just because you read your chapter today, it's not supposed to stop there. You're supposed to take in the Word of God so you can live out the Word of God. It's not just about what we're bringing in. It's about what we're putting back out. The whole idea is to plant and nurture the seed so it can grow. That's the whole idea. It is not to hear the Word of God only, but to apply it. Jesus is he's about to put them in a situation where they get to actually apply what they learned. And again, I'm glad I wasn't in the boat. Because chances are we would have done the same thing the disciples were doing. We would have panicked. They had a long way to go. They, they needed to learn. What good is instruction if it's never followed? 
So Jesus gives them instruction. And then he says, now I'm giving you an opportunity to exercise what you have learned. Oh, goody, goody. This is the disciples' chance. The disciples allowed their fear to get to the point where they began to question God. They even questioned him. Do you not care about us? Do you not care about us? This was right after Jesus told them that they were going to the other side. We're we're going to the other side. But the storm somehow deleted that information from their database. The storm got big. The storm got scary. And they start, now they're questioning God. They're questioning what's going to happen next. They're, They're just living in fear at this time. The storm that God sent wasn't to teach them how to survive in tough situations. It was to teach them how to trust in tough situations. You've got to be able to trust me. Even when it gets hard, you've got to be able to trust me. Trust me. Yeah, but it's a big storm. How big is your God? Bigger than the storm. Okay, which one's going to win? God always wins. God always wins. Then the storm isn't there to teach you how to survive in tough situations. It's there to teach you how to trust in tough situations. Jesus knew exactly why the disciples were afraid. The storm was intimidating. Yeah, they were scared. And we all get it. The question was, why were they so afraid when they already had the knowledge they were given? Did I not tell you we were going to the other side? Yes. Is this the other side? No. Why are you afraid? Because we don't trust you. Because the storm is be, it's getting so big that we're wondering about your character and your abilities. This is your chance to put into practice what I just taught you. Fears will come in life, <clears throat> but they cannot be allowed to take over. They, they cannot. 2020 has been an ever-growing storm. And I don't know, we still have a little time left. Uh, who knows what's going to com- come the rest of the year. <clears throat> there's still uncertainties ahead. And we know that. There's, the unknown is always in the future. It's always coming. And a lot of people fear the unknown. But I want to remind every, everybody that God is not worked up about this at all. He's, he's not freaked out. He's not even a little bit nervous. God's not nervous at all. He is, pe- he is pe- as peaceful as a person who is asleep on a pillow. That is where, that's where Jesus Christ is. That's where you're going to find him. Are you... <clears throat> all right, we're good? Everything? Okay, good. Um, are you trusting that Jesus has it under control? Because he's not worked up about this. Ask him. Go ahead and ask him. Are you scared? No, I'm not. Why not? Uh, past, present, future thing. I know it all. Uh, I've seen, I've seen, I've been there. I already know how it's going to turn out. But how are you going to turn out? How are you going to turn out in the middle of all of it? That's your choice. God's not making that call. You're making that call. He knows what's coming. But how are you going to grow during that time is up to you. He gives you that freedom. He gives you the free will. Are you going to question his character through it all? Or are you going to tell him scoot over because you're going to need some of that pillow? I'm going to rest too. Because you've got this under control. You said I was going to make it to the other side. I'm going to be fine. I'm going to make it to the other side. I'd like to rest too. Instead of panic and worry and let the anxiety build up in my life. I just want to rest too. Which choice are you going to make during the trip? It's your call. The storm taught the disciples so much that day. They, They learned a lot. First, they were not the ones in control. Ask any one of them. Hey, you guys got this? No, we don't have it. We don't have it. We're impending doom. That's what we see. We, do, we don't have this. The situation was so much bigger than their abilities to solve it. They understood right away, we are not the ones in control. But to learn that you are not in control will either cause you to fear or rely on God and the choice is yours. You get to choose. Am I going to be afraid? I'm out of control. There's no, I can't control this. So I either get to fear or I get to rely on God. I get one choice or the other, but it's my choice to make. Most people choose fear. 
That, that's what we choose. Look at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25. It says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? The question is, by worrying, which one of you can change what you do not have the ability to change? Which one of you? Who's going to just grow another six inches just because you said so? I'm not talking out. We do have the ability to do that. I mean up. Which one of you are going to add to your stature by worrying? You can't, you, your worry cannot control the things that you don't have the ability to control. It's a, it's a really good question. By worrying, which one of you can change what you do not have the ability to change. Uh, Jesus asked that question, by the way. All right, I'm going to go with him. Uh, he's, if I don't have the ability to change it, why am I worried about it? The disciples made the choice to worry rather than to trust. They were afraid. When Jesus asked them where their faith was, he also revealed the purpose for the storm. The storm gave them the chance to put into practice what they already knew. It, it gave them the chance. By the way, the storms that come in your life, 2020 is a really good opportunity for all of us to put into practice what we've already learned. We've opened the Word of God many, many times. We've, we've seen the stories. We know the evidence. God is real. God is real. We all know Him. We all, we, there's so much evidence out there for us to believe that there's a God and He is a powerful, powerful God. 2020 is a pretty good-sized storm but it is an opportunity to put into practice what you have already learned. How are we doing? How are we doing with it? Are we living in fear? Are we, are we panicking? Is the anxiety building up? Or are we still resting with Christ? Because he's got this under control. <clears throat> Jesus was the one who healed the sick and raised the dead. He was the one who gave the blind man sight and made it so the lame man could walk again. Every everything the disciples have seen up to this point. They've seen Jesus. They've seen what he can do. Even the verse that we just read in Matthew about not worrying was taught to them before they faced this storm. They even heard that verse right there, the one that says, by worrying, which one of you are able to change what you're not able to change. They've even been taught that lesson before this storm came. This storm was their opportunity to apply everything that they had heard and everything that they had seen. They, this was their chance. They were failing to see one extremely important truth. They were missing this truth right here. 2 Timothy 1.7 For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. We meet together every Sunday. We come back here every Sunday. The faithfulness, we, we've got faithful people. We come together every Sunday. We open up God's Word and we dive in to see what God has for us every single week. We hear what He wants us to hear. The question is, what do we do with it when the storm comes? What do we do with all that we've heard? All that we've learned? All the areas we've dug deeper? What do we do when the storm comes? Job was a man in the Bible who undisputedly suffered more than most. I think everybody would agree. Yeah, he, he got it bad. He got it bad. He suffered a lot. He lost his possessions. He lost his health. He lost his family and his friends. But he's become very famous for one certain statement. <clears throat> And during all, all the loss he experienced, he had one thing to say about God. And he's, been, he's become extremely famous for this one verse. Job thirteen fifteen, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. What if, it brings, what if God allows you to die? I trust him. No matter how bad it gets, I trust him. Even if it costs me my life, I trust him. I trust God. 
Job had two options just like the rest of us. He could worry and go into panic mode, which we naturally do. We've got, we are really good at that, by the way. We, we know how to do that. He could worry and go into panic mode, or he could rest in God knowing that God would not forsake him. God still loves me. He's going to take me through this. And even if everything doesn't go the way I want it to go, it's still going to go in the right way if God's the one directing the path. Even if I don't like it, it's what needed to be accomplished, and I trust him. I trust him. We know <clears throat> God exists, and he's there for us based on what we've experienced and because of what we've learned. I believe everyone in here trusts in God. We know he's there because of what he's done within our own hearts. You're never going to convince me that God's not real. You're never going to convince me that I'm not saved. And you're never going to convince me that I'm saved by any other thing than what Jesus Christ did for me, his sacrificial gift. You're never going to convince me it's him. It's him all the way. What he did in my life when I got saved, that moment when you got saved, do you remember that moment when you got saved? When he exchanged your old spirit for his life? What an awesome, awesome experience. You're never going to convince me that he's not there. You, you can't, you're not going to be able to do that. We know that he's there because of what he's done even inside of our own hearts. There's no denying that God's real and he's alive and that he loves us. But it's easier to worry over what we can see rather than trust in what we can't. But this is where faith exists. This is where, this is where it camps out. Look at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence <clears throat> of things not seen. I just don't know the future. You don't see it? No? Then um, <clears throat> how about trust the one who does? That'll require faith. Bingo. Bingo. That's it. That's it. Faith. Just because we don't know the future, nor do we know what God has planned, doesn't mean that we cannot trust him. Because he, know, he does know the future and he does know what he has planned. I know the future. We're going to the other side. Okay, then what about the storm in the middle? Are you at the other side yet? No. Why are we worrying yet? We still haven't done what God said he would do. So why are we worried yet? Our God remains good and he remains on the throne. No matter who is in the White House, no matter who is handing out prescriptions or what they say is good or bad for us, no matter what the condition of the whole world goes in, they cannot take him off the throne. He's still on the throne. There will never be an election or a virus that will change that. He is still on the throne and he will always be on the throne. Satan would love nothing more than for God's people to fear what they cannot see or control. You got to fear it. He wants you to fear it. During the remainder of this year, we all have the opportunity to put into practice what we know about God and his word. Here's your, here's your shot. This is our chance. We get to put into practice what we know about God and what we've learned about his word. <clears throat> we must get to the point when Satan tempts us to be afraid that we can honestly say, I'm afraid, I'm just not afraid. I'm afraid, I'm not afraid. Uh, do you know what's going to happen? No. Why aren't you afraid? I'm afraid I'm just not. I'm afraid I'm not afraid. I trust my God. He can do no wrong. He is faithful and he has always been faithful. Yeah, but I want you to fear. I'm afraid I'm not afraid. I trust him. I trust him. Our struggles are the places where our faith is the most impressive. And hear, hear me out on this. Your faith is so impressive when you're going through the struggles. My goodness, it's impressive. People are not impressed with how well you handle the good times. Man, they are rich and they're handling it pretty well. Not real impressive, is it? <laughs> not really impressive at all. It doesn't make much of an impact when everything's going our way and we are praising God. It doesn't make that big of an impact, but it echoes in the ears of everyone when they see your trust in God during the shaky times. Yeah, you're in a pretty scary situation. I trust him. 
I trust Him. Yeah, but what's tomorrow look like? What's going to happen in your life? I don't know. Well, I'm, af- I'm afraid I'm just not afraid. Because He's still on the throne. What if He gets off the throne? Can not happen. He's never going to leave the throne. He's still in control. He's still on the throne. This is an opportunity for God to become very evident in your life. Whatever the storm, the storm is, this is the time for God to really shine through your hard times, through your struggles. For the rest of 2020 and into 2021, I want to give you a verse to keep at the forefront of your minds. I, I would like, and it would be a good idea if we all just took this and I, I've highlighted all the points I want you to see here. It would be good if we would all take this for the rest of this year and into next year. Isaiah 41 and verse 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's a pretty awesome promise from a God who cannot lie. I like that a lot. I am with you. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you. That's an awesome promise. And since his track record is pretty decent, he cannot lie. He has never lied. I think we can take this one to the bank. I think we can. I am with you. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you. It's a big storm. I am with you. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you. Then I'm going to need some of that pillow. Absolutely. Absolutely. Satan says, why aren't you afraid? I'm afraid. I'm just not afraid. I'm afraid I'm not afraid because I've got a big God. With those words in that verse, those words, he's with us. He's our God. He's going to strengthen us. He's going to help us. He's going to uphold us. With those words right there, I can trust that we're going to make it to the other side. We're, we're going to be all right. We're going to make it to the other side. Satan, I'm afraid I'm not afraid. I'm afraid I'm not afraid. Because God is so amazing. He's so amazing. God is way too great for me to fear that any attempt to take him down is possible. God is just too amazing. Even if our circumstances become worse, may the world see that our faith and our trust in God is greater than that, the circumstances. Let them, let them see it. It is through suffering and hard times that Christ's likeness is seen the brightest. So when it gets tough, shine, shine. When it gets difficult and you don't know the future, say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him? I will trust him. People will see a difference in you. Why are you not panicking? Because I got a pillow with my name on it. I can rest. I can trust. He said, I'm going to make it to the other side. He's going to be with me. He's going to help me. He's going to strengthen me. He's going to uphold me. I, I, I don't need to worry about this. I don't need to worry about this. When people treat you wrong and you rise above it, Christ is seen and it shines bright. When panic is all around you and you are trusting God through it all, Christ is seen and He is shining bright. When someone disagrees with you and you do not allow it to become a wedge in your relationship, Christ is seen and He is shining bright. When the storms come, when the struggles come, and your in Christ's likeness is seen in you, it is more evident to people in the tough times than it is when you are going through the good times. The storm is your chance to put into practice what God has been teaching you. This is when God's people rise, not when they fall. This is when we show up. The tough times. We have to make calls in our life. We have to, we have to move forward. We, we do have to move forward. And a lot of times we're going to move forward in areas where we just don't, we just don't know what's going to happen. And yes, they can be scary. Jesus wasn't saying, why are you afraid because of the storm? That's a no-brainer. You got it. I'm asking you, why are you afraid knowing 
all that you already know, all that you've been given, all that you've been shown. Why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? I know the storm's intimidating. I know you don't have the control. I know you don't have the knowledge of what's going to happen. You don't know how this is going to turn out. And yes, I understand that it can be a fearful thing. But why are you fearful knowing what you know about me? I'm going to need a pillow. He's right. He's right. I can't live in fear. Satan says, I want you to live in fear. I'm afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm going to rest in God. I'm going to rest in God. He loves us. We are going to make it to the other side. No matter what you're going through, we're going to make it to the other side. And I know that's true. Because one wise man once said, I am with you. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you. And he does not lie. He cannot lie. So knowing what you know, it, when Satan tells you to be afraid, one statement's really easy to make. I'm afraid. I'm not afraid. 